Thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, this is another lecture in our Constitutional Studies Forum uh, series, and I appreciate everyone coming out. The last time we were here, it was one of the coldest days of the year, so I was, I'm equally grateful for you guys, although more toughness was shown in February, I guess. Um, the series is, I should say, sponsored by the Department of Political Science and also supported by the funding of the Jack Miller Center, so we're grateful for that. Um, we're going to hear today about John Locke, and the question was John Locke, a libertarian. Our speaker is uh, Professor David Azarad, who is a professor at Hillsdale College's uh, um, Washington Center. Prior to joining Hillsdale, Dr. Azarad was the director of the B. Kenneth Simon Center for Principles and Politics at the Heritage Foundation. And he has taught previously at American University and the University of Dallas. He is a native of Montreal and received his BA from Concordia University, his MA from Carleton, and his PhD in politics from the University of Dallas. So he is a great Canadian in the pantheon with Norm MacDonald, like right about there with William Shatner, I think. Um, but that's in the objective pantheon. Subjectively, he is my favorite Canadian um, and my favorite Lockean. Uh, although you may take issue with that, I guess. Uh, anyway, please join me in welcoming him, and uh, and we'll I'll turn it over to you, David. So, all right. Thanks. I don't know how much of a compliment that is because I don't think Carson knows more than one Canadian, so I, I don't know <laughs> what it says for me to be his favorite Canadian. So our topic today is was Locke a libertarian? Um, have any of you here heard of the Cato Institute? Uh, it's the largest and most prominent libertarian think tank in the world. If you go to Washington, D.C., where I live on Massachusetts Avenue, it's a big building there. And if you go into the basement, they have 24 black and white portraits of great thinkers arranged chronologically. The very first one is a portrait of John Locke. Uh, if you look at Robert Nozick's book, Anarchy, State, and Utopia, which is considered by many to be the foundational text of modern libertarianism, John Locke is cited more than any other thinker or philosopher in that work. Murray Rothbart, who's one of the great libertarian theorists, referred to Locke as, quote, the great libertarian political theorist John Locke. Friedrich Hayek, who is revered by libertarians, although he did not call himself a libertarian, claims to have found in Locke the principles of the true individualism that he defends. Uh, and there's a book that's called The Libertarian Reader, edited by David Boaz, who works at the Cato Institute. In the introduction, he calls Locke the principal architect of libertarianism. And I think I see why the libertarians are so eager to claim Locke as their own because one finds much in Locke that agrees with libertarianism. And I'll just give you a, a, a quick and dirty definition of libertarianism for the purposes of this talk. I'm well aware that there are different strands of libertarianism, that there are disagreements. I want to focus at the macro level at, you know, I know one when I see one. Uh, I define libertarianism as a worldview that posits that consenting adults are free to do whatever they want so long as they don't aggress anyone else. So basically, it's a free country, adults can do whatever they want, so long as everyone is consenting and you're not aggressing someone else. Basically, a worldview that reduces morality to what the libertarians call the non-aggression principle. Non-aggression for non-aggressors. And one thing that flows from that is that we have no binding positive duties to help others. Libertarians will say, you're free to do so, but uh, to put it in simple terms, other people's problems are never your problems unless you choose to make them so. You don't have a duty to feed, clothe, help anyone else. We're each free and sovereign. And if you turn to Locke's writings, I think you will find much that would lend credence to the view that Locke is a libertarian. Locke is, after all, a philosopher of liberty. He teaches that the natural state of man is one of freedom. He says uh, in his writings, I mean, he clearly is emphasizing rights over duties, the individual over the community. He says at one point that man is, quote, absolute lord of his own person and possessions. That uh, sounds like libertarianism to me. When he turns from the individual to the state and he tries to describe what are the powers that the government has, he says that government has, quote, no other end but the preservation of property. 
In other words, according to Locke, the government is not in the business of making you a good person, making sure you're not harming yourself. It is not to use our language today in the business of legislating morality. Locke thinks that the government exists to secure your rights, protect your property, protect your liberty, and otherwise that you should be left alone to live your life as you see fit. Now, here's where things get interesting, though. And I think this speaks to Locke's enormous influence on the world. It's not just the libertarians who claim Locke, but conservatives and liberals also claim Locke as one of their own. And they have a pretty good case based on what Locke writes. So the conservatives, for example, point out that Locke seems to have been fascinated with scripture, that half of his published works deal with the Bible. They uh, point to the numerous invocations of God and natural law in his writings, and the fact that his book, Some Thoughts Concerning Education, is all about the cultivation of virtue in children. Liberals, for their part, say, yeah, but Locke also emphasized the natural equality of men and women. He was very critical of patriarchy. Uh, he defended the separation of church and state, and he said that reason, not revelation, was our only star and compass. So it would seem, at least on the surface, that Locke is all things to everyone and that he speaks to all of us. Uh, the one exception would be the woke left. I, I think that Locke is too white, too straight, too male to be claimed by the woke left, but uh, setting that part of our contemporary politics aside, everyone seems eager to claim Locke. Now, you may say at this point, who cares? You know, Locke is long dead. Let the libertarians, conservatives, and liberals all have him. What's it to me whether Locke was a libertarian or a Socidian or a heaven knows what or a closeted monarchist? I think Locke matters, though, for two reasons. That he's different from some of the other thinkers in the tradition because he really matters to us in particular, us moderns and us Americans, uh, for two reasons. One is Locke's enormous and undeniable influence on the American founding. Uh, Locke's second treatise has been called the textbook of the American Revolution, and Locke has been hailed as America's philosopher. Uh, Jefferson lifted verbatim two passages from the second treatise, which he included in the Declaration of Independence. I won't say plagiarized because you're college students and I don't want to give you bad ideas, but uh, the line, long train of abuses, and the line uh, that men are more disposed to suffer is straight out of Locke. Uh, more importantly, the whole of the Declaration of Independence is a thoroughly Lockean document. The idea that human beings have rights, that governments exist to secure these rights, that government has to be based on the consent of the governed, that all men are created equal, that's right out of Locke. One of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, Benjamin Rush, Rush pardon me, called Locke an oracle as to the principles of government. And then second, Locke wasn't just influential on America. Locke had an enormous influence on the modern world, i.e. on building the modern world we live in. In his writings, I think you will find the deepest and perhaps clearest articulation of the foundational concepts that have shaped the modern consciousness. Equality, rights, government by consent, liberty, property. All of this is in Locke. I'd put it to you this way. Since the ancien regime of aristocratic privilege and inequality is dead and gone, since all modern politics takes place within the parameters of equality and rights, then what Locke really thought is actually of great import to us. Because think of it this way. If Locke was indeed a libertarian, then it means that America, at its core, is libertarian. And that many features of our contemporary culture that the founders would have never envisaged, say for example the legalization of drugs, or the ongoing sexual revolution, are in fact necessary workings out of the Lockean teaching. You could say, if Locke was a libertarianism, it was, was a libertarian part of me, it would mean that libertarianism was embedded in the American founding and that a lot of what we see today is just a working out of principles that were all baked into the Lockean cake, you could say.
and that would be the case not just for America, but for all modern developed liberal democracies. So I think for this reason, uh, the question matters. And the way I propose to treat it is, uh, well, first beginning with the surface. Uh, I, I conceded that on the surface you can find many passages in Locke that make him sound like a libertarian. However, I think you can find many passages that would give palpitations to libertarians uh, in Locke's readings. Uh, and I want to look, I, I gave you a handout, there are four of them that reflect four important Locking teachings. And I would look, uh, like to look at them and in every single case I, I, I could not I have never heard of a single libertarian, no matter what strand of libertarian that person is, who would uh, embrace this Lockean position. In fact, some of them are so beyond the pale of libertarianism that they're never even considered by libertarianism, because in the same way that many of you have never bothered to argue why the earth is not flat, it's not even worth engaging at this point. So let's look at the first one, which is what I would call the illiberal lock. Uh, in his letter concerning toleration, Locke places two very, very far-reaching restrictions on free speech. The first one, which is not a passage I cited, is Locke bans atheism. He says, those who deny that a deity exists are in no way to be tolerated, end quote. Now, Locke does this not because he's a theocrat. He's not concerned with the fact that some people may not believe in God and won't go to heaven. He thinks that promises, covenants, and oaths are absolutely necessary for society to function. That you need to be able to trust people, to take them at their word. I mean, just take, think of the importance of oaths in our judiciary system, that people are swearing to say the truth. And Locke thinks, you don't need to agree with him, that atheists are not bound by, bound by their words because there's nothing to back it up. And so he says that in a Lockean society, the magistrate must ban atheism. Second, and I think even more shockingly, Locke wants to ban any speech that undermines good morals. So I'll read for you this first passage I read here at the top of the handout. He says, no doctrines adverse and contrary to human society or to the good morals that are necessary to the preservation of civil society are to be tolerated by the magistrate. So notice the language. He doesn't say the magistrate may forbid such doctrines. He says that he must not tolerate them. And I think if you start to think through the implications of this statement, and to put it bluntly, you could drive a, th a truck through the claim that you need to ban all doctrines that undermine good morals. I mean, just think of the kinds of things that would get banned in a Lockean society. Almost all popular music since the 1960s, because after all, what's the main theme of popular music? Sex, drugs, and rebellion. All sexually provocative advertising, which basically means almost all advertising. Uh, many, if not most, television shows and movies would be gone. Professor Holloway and I are fans of the show Seinfeld, but I think that in a Lockean society, Seinfeld would have to be banned because it depicts grown adults who are not married, are sleeping around, and two of them don't work. So, uh, in fact, I, I would tell you, in a, in a Lockean society, you'd have to ban libertarianism because it promotes licentiousness. So Locke, to sum up this first point, really gives no liberty to license. And I think this first point alone should settle the matter because libertarians are the closest thing we have to free speech absolutists. Some of them don't even want to criminalize defamation. So uh, important is it for them to allow people to say whatever they want, they would say, you are not aggressing or harming someone by spreading lies about them, that we don't have a right to our reputation. Now, however, I want to continue to prosecute the case. So let's look at a second restriction that Locke places on liberty that I think is beyond the pale for libertarians, and that's Locke's ban on suicide. Uh, I gave you uh, section six from the chapter two of the second treaties, which I'd like to read for you. So this is when 
Locke presents his teaching on the law of nature. So men are free in the state of nature, but the, law, the state of nature is governed by a law. And he says that law is reason, and here's what it teaches. But though this be a state of liberty, yet it is not a state of license. Though man in that state have an uncontrollable liberty to dispose of his person or possessions. So this is where Locke sounds like a libertarian. Yet, he has not liberty to destroy himself, or so much as any creature in his possession, but were some nobler use than its bare preservation, calls for it. So Locke was also not a vegetarian. But for our purposes, what matters is, he clearly says the law of nature forbids suicide. Now, it is true, uh, Straussian scholars like to point out that in chapter 4 of the Second Treatise, he makes an exception. He says that uh, if you've forfeited your life by committing a kind of crime that warrants the death penalty, you may be offered as a lesser punishment slavery. And you may choose to become a slave rather than get killed. And he says, if at one point you get tired of being enslaved, you can resist the will of your master and draw upon yourself the death you wish. In effect, killing yourself. Now, you can argue as to whether or not that's suicide, right? You could say, well, you already forfeited your life, so you're already dead. I think that's a spurious argument. I think Locke is making an exception. That being said, it's a pretty narrow one. I mean, you need to have committed a capital crime and then in that case, you may need to be, you know, a chain of, seri uh, of consequences need to follow. But for the ordinary person, Locke does not accept that you have a right to end your life when you're, I don't know, it's too painful to have the disease you have or you don't feel you want to keep on living. Uh, this, of course, is beyond the pale for libertarians. I mean, libertarians posit that you own yourself and you are at liberty to do with yourself whatever you want. Uh, individuals have a right to, uh, by the way, for libertarians, even to harm themselves. That's why libertarians say that the morality principle is not uh, John Stuart Mill's no harm principle, but the non-aggression principle. You shouldn't aggress others, but by definition they would say you can't aggress yourself because you're consenting to doing to yourself whatever it is you want. Now we've looked at two restrictions, pretty serious ones, that Locke places on liberty. I now would like to look at a binding positive duty that Locke places on all of us. So remember, libertarianism, the twin poles are no restriction on your liberty aside from not aggressing others. But then the flip side of that is you're not obliged to care for others. You're not obliged to feed them, clothe them, educate them. You can if you want, but no one can force you to address other people's problems. Uh, let's look at Locke's other formulation of the law of nature, again from the Second Treatise, chapter six, chapter six, pardon me, section six. This is the third quote on the handout. Locke says, everyone, as he is bound to preserve himself and not to quit his station willfully, so by the like reason, when his own preservation comes not in competition, ought he as much as he can to preserve the rest of mankind, and may not, unless it be to do justice to an offender, take away or impair the life, or what tends to the preservation of the life, the liberty, health, limb, or goods of another. This duty to preserve mankind is qualified in an important way, that's true, right? You first of all need to make sure that your own preservation is assured. So Locke is not calling on us to heroically sacrifice our lives for others. Uh, and I will admit that in the state of nature, which Locke says is a very dangerous condition because there's no government, it's filled with violence, there's very little because nature doesn't provide, it ends up resembling Hobbes' state of nature it is true that in this case, the law of nature is not going to amount to much because you're in a perpetual state of fear. That's not going to lead you to, uh, to help and try to preserve others. In all likelihood, Locke recognizes more often than not in the state of nature, the law of nature gives you a right to kill others. Locke calls this a very strange doctrine, but he says because you feel threatened, you're more likely to invoke the law of nature to kill others than to preserve them. 
Now, none of us live in the state of nature. We all live in very, very safe, very, very prosperous Lockean societies. And then to me, what's interesting to think through is, what does this commandment to preserve mankind mean in the context that we live in, i.e. safety, plenty, and prosperity? I think it clearly points to some form of a limited welfare state. Uh, I think in Locke's time, it may not have amounted to much, although Locke himself draws out some implications that I think would horrify libertarians. He has an essay that he wrote on poor laws, how to deal with poor people in England at the time. And he says, everyone must have meat, drink, clothing, and firing, i.e. heat, firewood. So much goes out of the stock of the kingdom, whether they work or no i.e. even if you are not working, you are entitled to meat, drink, clothing, and firing from the common stock of the kingdom. And in this passage that I had you read, you notice that he includes not just life, liberty, limb, but also health. Now think through what this means for one second. You are not allowed to deny emergency health care to people who are in need. I would also add, you're not allowed to deny to people life-saving medicine if they can't afford it. You shouldn't sacrifice your own life. You know, if, if Locke would say, if there's only uh, life-saving medicine for two people, you and the other, you take it. You don't need to give it to the other. But in America today, we have plenty to go around. What's more, the law of nature isn't just about your fellow Americans or your fellow countrymen. It applies to mankind. So think of what this means for one second. Locke is saying, we very wealthy Westerners have a duty to provide life-saving medicines to third world peoples who can't afford them. I mean, Locke doesn't say that himself, but it is a perfectly legitimate, and I would argue necessary inference from the principles he lays down. So, while I won't go so far as to claim that you know, Locke embraces something like Christian charity, and I fully recognize that in Locke, rights trump duties. Remember, you only turn to the preservation of others after you first ensured your own preservation. Nevertheless, it is undeniable that Locke recognizes that we have positive duties, binding positive duties that the government can enforce to preserve not only our fellow countrymen, but the rest of mankind. And then fourth, I want to bring it all together by looking at Locke's teaching on the family. Because in his teaching on the family, you see both of these uh, doctrines that would be anathema to libertarians. A restriction on the liberty of adults and a duty to provide for others. Uh, Locke's teaching on the family is complicated. It has many dimensions. I just want to highlight two. The first is the restriction he places on divorce. Locke's teaching on divorce uh, is subject to some interpretation, but he clearly does not endorse a no-fault divorce regime. He says that parents are obliged to remain married until, quote, the children can shift for themselves. So you're not allowed to divorce until the children have reached an age where they can, are independent. And then second, he says, it is legitimate for positive law, i.e. the magistrate, to make marriages perpetual. So he's saying the nature of marriage is not for life. He says the nature of the thing is only as long as the kids need you. He's not saying you need to divorce afterwards, but you may. However, he then says it is legitimate for the government to make marriages perpetual bar none. So in his discussion of marriage, or as he calls it with the, I mean, Locke is many things, but a romantic he is not. He calls marriage conjugal society. I mean, if any of you are looking to propose one day, I would not advise you ask a young woman, would you like to enter into a conjugal society with me? I mean, Locke is, uh, if you want romanticism, you turn to Rousseau, not to Locke. Um, but in his discussion of conjugal society, he clearly subordinates the liberty of adults to the well-being of children. 
And then second, and this is the one uh, that is even more striking, I think, is the duty he imposes on children to care for their parents. So Locke says that uh, children are bound to honor and assist their parents uh, for the rest of their lives in proportion to the care and attention that the parents bestowed on the children. So it's a contingent duty. If your biological parents abandoned you, Locke would say you owe them nothing. And even if your biological parents raised you, but they really did the bare, bare minimum, well, you owe them, in turn, the bare minimum. So uh, the Lockean family is animated, you could say, by a spirit of quid pro quo. Okay? This is not the biblical injunction, honor thy father or thy mother, which is a categorical imperative, no if, ands, or buts. That said, it's still a pretty burdensome duty. So I want to read for you the last passage. Uh, from, this is from chapter 7 of the Second Treaties, where Locke talks about his teaching on the family. This is the fourth quote on the handout. God, having made the parents instruments in his great design of continuing the race of mankind and the occasions of life to their children, as he hath laid on them an obligation to nourish, preserve, and bring up their offspring. So as a quick aside, uh, some libertarians go so far as to deny, Murray Rothbard, for example, that parents have a duty to provide for their children. So Rothbard says parents can watch their children freeze and starve to death because the kids' needs do not impose on the parents a binding duty to provide for them. Now, admittedly, this is not mainstream libertarianism, but Rothbard is the one who takes to its logical conclusion the idea that other people's problems are not your problems. Other people's needs do not impose on you a duty to fulfill them. Uh, to return to Locke. So he has laid on the children a perpetual obligation of honoring their parents. Okay, well, what does that mean to honor your parents? It means, which containing in it an inward esteem and reverence to be shown by all outward expressions, first of all, ties up the child from anything that may ever injure or affront, disturb or endanger the happiness or life or those of those from whom he received his. And then second, engages him in all actions of defense, relief, assistance, and comfort of those by whose means he entered into being and has been made capable of any enjoyments of life. From this obligation, no state, no freedom can absolve children. I mean, Think of how much further this goes than merely preserving your parents. You have a duty to ensure their happiness and their comfort. It's perpetual and nothing can absolve you of that duty. I mean, th this is a, a pretty big one uh, in Locke. Um, I've given you these four that I think are the four most striking ones. I could give you some other ones. Uh, Locke, in his essay on the poor laws, uh, Professor Holloway last night took me out to a, a very nice restaurant that had a large selection of beers. Locke wants to ban superfluous brandy shops and unnecessary alehouses. Um, he thinks that they're <laughs> corrosive to good morals. Locke says uh, in the letter concerning toleration that if there was a great plague that decimated all the cattle, except for, say, yours, sir, here, he says the government has a right to forbid you from slaughtering your cattle in order to replenish the stock of everyone. So to interfere with your right to private property because the common good requires that we now have cattle. So I just picked uh, these four, but I think one could find others. I think what these make clear is that Locke was most emphatically not a libertarian. Heck, I mean, I would tell you, if you look at the first one, Locke wasn't even a liberal, at least in the way that liberal is understood these days. I mean, my students are always shocked because they mostly know of Locke these days through his conservative critics. People like Patrick Deneen, like Yoram Hazoni, Sora Bamari, all of this post-liberal right, 
that says liberalism is bad, we need to go beyond it because liberalism leads to drag queen story at the local library. Liberalism means obscenity in the public square. Locke was not a liberal. Locke was actually quite uh, censorious. I mean, he not only wasn't a libertarian, he was not a free speech absolutist. Now, I want to press the, ma the matter further. Uh, I, think by, I think we can see even more clearly the difference between Locke and libertarians if we zoom out. If we compare the overarching aims of their political projects, i.e., what is the end goal of libertarianism and what is the end goal of Lockeanism? The end goal of libertarianism is actually quite easy to discern, to discern, pardon me. It's autonomy. The goal for libertarians is to create a world in which every last person is a self-legislating, sovereign individual. Do you know what the word autonomy means? It comes from the Greek autonomos, self-legislating. Uh, I think the libertarians would say John Donne the poet was right, was wrong. Each man is actually an island unto himself. Every individual, they think, should be free to fashion and refashion himself or herself into whatever he or she wants, subject only to the requirement, as we've mentioned, that you not aggress someone else. What matters, I put it for you this way, what matters for libertarians is that people be free. Not that they use their freedom in any one particular way. In fact, libertarians are resolutely non-judgmental when it comes to what people do with their freedom. There's an article that I found very helpful uh, to help me understand libertarianism and, and to be fair to it. It's by a gentleman named Walter Bloch. I think he's since passed. He was a fairly prominent libertarian at the time. And the article is called uh, Libertarianism versus Libertinism. And Bloch in the essay calls himself a cultural conservative and he denounces libertinism, you know, sexual freedom, drugs, uh, obscenity, as being perverted. However, he says, he doesn't want to ban it. He makes clear that the issue for a libertarian is not do you approve of someone else's lifestyle, but do you want to use the coercive powers of the government to forbid that person from living their life? So he says, I as a cultural conservative can disapprove of someone's lifestyle, I just don't think that it should be criminalized. He says, the libertarian is someone who thinks that the libertine should not be incarcerated. Uh, the libertarian project then is really just limited to emancipating the individual from all coercive strictures on his behavior. Once this is accomplished, once you've either eliminated government, many libertarians are anarchists. Murray Rothbard, for example, is I think the most prominent one. He called himself an anarcho-capitalist. He thought that markets would take care of everything, delivering mail, the police, you need no government whatsoever. Or, you know, some don't go that far. Uh, Robert Nozick, who I mentioned, wants to create what he calls a night watchman state. A very, very, very limited government that does the bare minimum of just securing rights to life, liberty, and property. Once that's been accomplished, libertarianism has no reason to continue to exist because it is not in the business of telling you how to live your life. So it's obviously a marvelously simple political theory, which I think is, accounts in no small part for its appeal. There are no ambiguities or trade-offs in libertarianism. Every question of public policy can be reduced to a simple consideration. Does this enhance or restrict the liberty of the individual, period. And, and as a result, libertarianism doesn't have all of the ambiguities and the paradoxes and the tensions that you find in almost every political theory. It is also, I, I should add, uh, and I don't mean to uh, take a dig at any libertarians in the room, but it is a marvelously self-indulgent worldview. I mean, it basically tells you that you get to do whatever the hell you want all the time, uh, and that other people's problems are not your problems. Uh, no one can force you to do what you don't want to do. If I was asked to select a song for the libertarian soundtrack, uh, I would recommend Rage Against the Machines, uh, F you, I won't do what you tell me. Uh, I think that would be a fitting 
testimony to the libertarian spirit. To hell with you, this is a free country, I don't have to do this. Now, what about Locke? Is Locke in the business of creating a world of autonomous, sovereign individuals? Well, as I told you from the outset is, in certain regards, yes. I mean, I think it's undeniable when you read Locke, when you read the Second Treaties, when you read the Letter Concerning Toleration, that Locke is encouraging all of us to think of ourselves first and foremost as rights bearing individuals. Locke wants to disentangle us from the authoritative communities that lay claim to our persons, our property, and our souls. You know, I, I found that the, the clearest way to think about it is there are three targets for Locke. The government, the family, and the church, i.e. political leaders, statesmen, fathers, and priests. All three of them lay claim to a part of you. All three of them claim to have a right to rule you, always for your own good. And Locke is trying to defang them, to say actually, no, these institutions exist to serve you and you enter them consensually. Uh, they don't have absolute power over you. So Locke is not trying to get rid of the government. Locke has no anarchist streak in him. He's not trying to abolish the family. You saw the teaching, there's limitations on divorce. He's also not trying to abolish churches. He is, however, trying, in fact, Locke was quite committed to religious liberty. Locke is, however, trying to defang them, to uh, limit their powers in order to better protect uh, the individual. And so in this sense, there are close affinities between Lockeanism and libertarianism. For both of them, you know, the analogy I always give my students is, you know when you play with your camera, you can zoom into something and make the rest blurry? So in a traditional society, the individual is blurry. And what is front and center would be the political community, the family, uh, religion, the priests. What Locke is doing is changing the focus. You still have families, churches, and political communities, but the individual is now front and center. And both libertarians and Lockeans, I think, will scoff at the claims of monarchs, fathers, and priests who want to coerce people's beliefs and actions. However, there is a profound difference because Locke's goal in disentangling the individual is not to make the individual an island onto himself who is free to do whatever he or she wants. Rather, the goal for Locke, he says this time and time again in the Second Treaties, is the preservation of mankind. He calls this the fundamental law of nature. Now, of course, a libertarian would say, well, we also want to preserve mankind. But libertarians only want to preserve mankind by not aggressing them, by not harming them. Locke agrees and says, but you need to do more. It's not enough to not kill someone. You may also need to provide for them. If you want to have functioning political societies, you will need, and you need functioning political societies to preserve mankind. Anarchy is a pipe dream. You are going to need to place some restrictions on the liberty and behavior of citizens, even if they're not technically aggressing or harming someone. For example, the restrictions he places on doctrines that undermine uh, good morals. So I put it to you this way. If in Locke there is a tension between individual autonomy and the preservation of mankind or of the political community, Locke picks the latter. He says that the preservation of mankind trumps autonomy when the two are in conflict. Now, I want to end by uh, addressing one important wrinkle uh, in the argument that I think is something that, you know, I first wrote this paper 10 years ago when I just finished writing my dissertation on Locke and I was much more Lockean than I am today. And in the ensuing 10 years, I've thought some more about Locke, I've studied libertarianism more, and I'm no longer as sure as I was for the following reason. 
I think the best argument that the libertarians have is, yeah, Azarad, of course we know these passages. But here's the thing. They're inconsistent with the underlying principles of Lockeanism. So yes, Locke says you need to ban atheism, you need to do this, you need to do that, but he has no grounds on a Lockean basis for doing so. And we, the libertarians, are the consistent Lockeanism. If Locke had thought through consistently his ideas, he would have had to arrive at libertarianism. And therefore, to put it to you this way, Locke, they would say, is an inconsistent libertarian. Uh, and this, of course, opens up the possibility that the libertarians are the consistent Lockeans. Now, this, I think, is the real challenge. Um, and I will admit that I have not fully resolved the question in my mind, but I have been thinking about how to approach it. And here's what I would suggest to you uh, before I wrap up and we turn to questions. I would break down Locke into three, its three constitutive components in order to understand what's going on. Uh, I, this is a simplification, admittedly, but I find it's helpful to understand what's going on. I think there are three parts to Locke. There's the foundation. The foundation is the anthropology. It's the state of nature. It's the idea that man's nature is freedom and that we possess rights. On top of that, this is the second component. Locke layers a natural law teaching. His law of nature which commands us to preserve mankind. And then number three, from that he derives the various powers he grants to the government. So it's an anthropology with a moral teaching from which he derives a political teaching. And what the libertarians are doing is they're keeping the anthropology. They keep the state of nature. They replace Locke's law of nature with the non-aggression principle, and then they derive very different conclusions. And to me, the ultimate challenge is the following one. Once you begin with an idea as radical as the state of nature, which is something that is very hard for us Americans to see, or us Canadians who aspire to be Americans also to see, because it's baked into our DNA. Of course we have rights, what are you talking about? But you need to realize what a revolutionary idea it is to say you are first and foremost not the son of your parents, not an American, not a whatever religion you were born to. You are first and foremost a free rights-bearing individual. And you get to pick your religion, you will get to pick which country you live in. You're not even bound to remain in the country you live in. Once you posit that man has, to quote Locke, an uncontrollable liberty, then couldn't you say that the non-aggression principle is actually the more reasonable moral principle to govern the state of nature? That Locke is, you could say, maybe an unstable concoction of two elements. He's got this explosive state of nature idea, and then he's got, yes, this quite reasonable law of nature teaching. But I think the libertarians say, but these two things don't go together. Actually, what goes better with the state of nature teaching is something like our non-aggression principle, and that we are, in fact, the consistent Lockeans. I, I'm not sure that I fully agree with this, but I, I, I must tell you, I have a quite hard time refuting this claim. Um, so here is my conclusion. I think that Locke was not a libertarian. I think that Locke did not intend to build a libertarian regime. I do, however, think that the radicalness of the state of nature teaching very much points towards libertarianism. Thank you. I guess I'm open to any and all questions from libertarians, Lockeans, neither of the above. All is fair game. All right, thank you for that great talk. Thank you, Carson. And uh, thank you all for your attention. We do have time for questions now. We have a microphone which will be used to make your question audible. Uh, for the record, so it'd be great to have a first question. I obviously have a lot of questions, um, but it'd be wonderful to have a first question from a student. Is there a student who wants to get the ball rolling? Or any other visitor? <laughs>
All right, it falls to me then. I'll start. Um, it seems to me that you could formulate it this way. I'd like to hear what you say about this, Dr. Azrad. Um, the libertarians make a mistake in regard to Locke because they think that in civil society you can do any thing that is morally innocent, whereas Locke doesn't in fact say that. He says that's the way it is in the state of nature, but there's a passage I think we've talked about at one point where he says, once you consent to enter into civil society, the government will have a right to make positive laws that are for the sake of the convenience and the preservation of everybody in the society. So that, for example, when there was a controversy a number of years ago about, say, uh, the Affordable Health Care Act, right, Obamacare, libertarians would criticize it by saying, well, the government doesn't have a right to control how you get your own health care. They can't regulate you and tell you what to do in that regard, but it seems to me that well, that may be a legitimate libertarian principle, but it's not a Lockean principle. Locke would say in the state of nature, you can do whatever you need to do that's moral to preserve yourself. But once you enter civil society, civil society may do things like, say, you need to have a license to practice medicine, things like this. I just wonder if you have a reaction to that. Uh, so I, I don't know if, you, if uh, uh, Carson is calling for a Lockean defense of Obamacare. I mean, that, that, might, that might be a, a bridge too far. But no, your point is well taken. I mean... One of the things I've noticed over the years in teaching and rereading the Second Treaties is there are two distinct considerations for Locke when you're thinking about politics. One is the rights of the individual, but then the second one is the common good or the preservation of the society as a whole. And Locke always distinguishes the two. The, the former is not reducible to the latter. So I think that what someone like Robert Nozick would say is, yeah, there is a common good. It exists when you secure, secure everyone's rights. The government doesn't need to do anything beyond that. The common good is the sum total of securing the rights of everyone in this room. What Locke would say is, obviously the government needs to secure rights, but there will be cases where there is a tension between the rights of some and what you need to do to preserve the society's health. So I gave you one rather innocuous example, the plague that kills all the cattle. And Locke, a libertarian would say, you're not allowed to tell me not to slaughter my cattle. The cattle is mine. I do with it what I want. Locke would say, actually, look, we need to replenish the, uh, what do you call it? Cattle is not flocks, it's the, I'm losing my, herds, that's it. Uh, you need to replenish the herds. You are forbidden from slaughtering your own cattle until they reprodu reproduce sufficiently, you sell them off to others, and then you'll be allowed to do so again. These are two distinct considerations. Now, to go back to my point though, you know, take a more extreme example. Can the government ask you to risk your life to defend the country? I mean, Locke says yes, but you really gotta ask yourself, how can he justify that? Locke teaches you that the only reason we hive government is to protect your rights. Because in the state of nature, it's very dangerous. Everyone is trying to kill you. So we set up a government for one reason and one reason only, to protect our rights. And then you want me to risk my life to protect my life? That doesn't make sense. And so I, I, I think you could make the argument, you know, Strauss says this in Natural Right and History, he says this about Hobbes, but I think you could apply it to Locke, that he destroyed the moral basis of national defense. I, I, I think it, it becomes hard in a Lockean society to justify the power of conscription, which, by the way, is an absolutely necessary power because the political community will be attacked. Now, Locke himself grants this power to the government. I just think, to go back to my point, I think there's a tension in Locke that the libertarians uh, exploit. Now, I'll say one last thing. Look, this tension is at the heart of politics. I mean, there is always a tension between what the individuals want and what the common good requires. And there is always a, t a temptation to try to resolve that tension. So I think some of you have read Plato's Republic. Uh, Socrates in the city and speech solves that problems for the guardians by basically abolishing their individualism.
uh, they have no families and no property. Uh, Marx resolves this tension by claiming that man's nature is social and that after the communist revolution, we will all be social beings and that selfishness will disappear. The libertarians try to solve this tension by saying the common good is reducible to the aggregation of everyone's individual rights being secured. I would say Locke, to his credit, doesn't solve the tension because the tension can't be solved. There will be such a tension, it is at the heart of politics. And I would say that Locke, to his credit, recognizes it. But I guess to his discredit, in a certain sense, heightens it by emphasizing so much the rights and liberties of the individual and the idea that the political community exists for the individual, which makes it then hard to justify restrictions on the liberty of the individual. Could I follow up just yeah, a little please. bit? And uh, I learned something that I did not know about Locke. Uh, I'm not surprised, or I'd forgotten about Locke, and I just want to build on the distinction I made a minute ago between the state of nature and civil society. I take it that based on what he says in the state of nature, according to natural law, if you have children with somebody and they're grown up and can shift for themselves, then that couple doesn't need to stay together any longer. But you said the magistrate can legitimately make marriage permanent. Yeah. So what's the reasoning by which you would impose that obligation on people or by which the magistrate would do that? Why does Locke think it may be, or does he explain? He doesn't. Okay. Uh, he, he, he doesn't get into it. Um, you know, the one thing I'll say in his defense is a lot of Locke's conservative critics latch on to the first part and almost make it sound like Locke is saying you have to divorce when the kids are grown. He never says that. He simply says that if you want to understand uh, the nature of a community, you should look to its ends. And for him, the primary overarching aim of conjugal society is the procreation procreation education of children. It's not the only end. He also says it's the care that the spouses will have for one another, but that the overarching aim is that, and then once that aim has been accomplished, there is nothing inherent in marriage that requires it to go on forever. Um. Okay, thank you. Other questions? I've got the mic. Oh, let me bring the mic to you, Professor. Yet you were pointing out the tension between the um, liberty in the state of nature and then moving to a preservation principle when society begins. Um, and I agree, there is that, and the libertarians look more consistent. But if instead of a, a preservation principle, you go to a contractarian principle where what limits liberty is a voluntarily agreed to uh, cooperative set of rules to advance the common good, is that more consistent? So do you, do you have a particular thinker in mind who would make this argument, or you're asking it generally? Me? <laughs> no, contractarians, contractarians generally, yeah, uh-huh. Uh, yeah, so you would say, well, I, I guess that's a good question. You know, why um, couldn't we all agree to set up a, a, a non-libertarian society? Yeah, I mean, we could do that, I, uh, my point is simply that I, I think the explosiveness, explosiveness of the state of nature teaching, it's radicalness that, again, as I said, we don't see anymore. But, you know, uh, Law, uh, Hobbes, who introduced the concept, he apologized for the term at, at first, when he first uses the term state of nature, and de kiwe, I think is how you pronounce it in pedantic Latin, but I didn't do Latin, or de kiwe, de kiwe. Um, apologizes for the term state of nature. He realized this is not a natural way to think about human beings. I just think that you're less likely to have that. But yes, nothing would forbid you from doing so. I mean, you could contract to set up any kind of a society, uh, pretty much. Although Locke would say you couldn't uh, contract to set up a society that would harm the rights of others. Yeah, you, you couldn't uh, agree to set up a society in which you sacrifice children to the rain gods. Locke would say that that wouldn't be permitted because it violates the law of nature. But I guess you're saying, couldn't you go beyond the law of nature? I, I think you could, 
I just remain bothered by, uh, I guess, what kind of contract best accords with the principles of the state of nature? Um, I don't think it's a Hobbesian one. I'm not sure it's a Lockean one. The more I think about it, the more it seems to me it would be a libertarian one. Yeah, what about a Rawlsian one? I got the mic, so I'm amplifying for our questioner. Yeah. Um, well, what do I think or what would Locke think? Um, I, I think that, you know, the, the great, I mean, Rawls is also a radical in his own way. I mean, it doesn't come across in the prose. It doesn't even come across so much in the political teaching. I mean, he really ends up with basically, you know, a liberal democracy with a welfare state. But... The radicalness I see in Rawls is the idea that the birth lottery is unjust and that the accidents of birth, our genes, our parents, the country we're born into, uh, it's not fair that some are born into better circumstances than others and that it is the role of politics to control for the accidents of birth rather than to uh, control for what people do to one another as adults. That's a pretty radical idea. Now, Rawls doesn't take it, I think, as far as it could go. Um, I, I think Rawls, in a certain sense, is like Locke in this regard, that there's an explosive idea that he doesn't take as far. Uh, Locke's view, I, I think, would be to say, uh, this is not a matter of justice. Uh, it may be a matter of science may want to remedy some of the injustices, what seem to us as injustices of birth, that some people are born with a birth defect. That doesn't seem very fair. Uh, Locke was a Baconian in terms of wanting science to turn to the relief of man's estate. No more abstract contemplation of the heavens. Make science Cartesian and Baconian and make it provide for man. So, I think he would say we could, uh, at least on the natural contingencies, science may do something about it, but it's not in the Lockean framework to view the fact that some people are born to wealthy parents to be an injustice that the political community should remedy while others are born to poor parents. His, his law of nature teaching is not about giving everyone an equal opportunity in the race of life. Um, it is really about ensuring that people are preserved. Um, so uh, I think that's what he might think uh, of, of Rawls. It's also two, you know, very different, I mean, look, they're both abstractions. I mean, both of them are asking us to abstract from a lot. Locke is asking us to abstract from our normal day-to-day -day environment and to think of ourselves in this state of nature teaching. Um, Rawls is asking us to abstract from our own bodies. I mean, you need to ask yourself if the type of thinking that Rawls is asking us to do in a theory of justice is even possible. Meaning for us to think, I, I, I don't know if I'm a man or a woman, if I'm Jewish, Christian, or atheist, if I'm tall or short, uh, ugly or beautiful, rich or poor, if I'm smart or dumb. I mean, all of the things that make me me, I need to abstract from and imagine that I'm, I mean, a, a disembodied mind. I, 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 I mean, heaven knows the, the Lockean abstraction is already a push. I think the Rawlsian one is an even bigger one. All right, other questions, other questioners? Yes, I'll bring the mic to you. Quick question, I'm not 100% sure this is apropos to your lecture, but um, Locke spends a lot of time looking at the government only doing what is to preserve morality. Does he, uh, your opinion, does he address the idea or does he approach the idea of morals as objective and universal or does he also acknowledge that there are some things that are considered moral that are so socially constructed or subjective and I don't know if it makes a difference but well I, I mean 
he, he'd say both. I mean, clearly there is an objective law of nature which he equates with reason, which teaches all men if they will but consult it. I mean, that's another. That's a pretty big caveat that you need to consult reason and not be dragged hither and thither by your passions. That because we're all the same species, uh, because we all uh, are, were made by the same God. Uh, we are under a duty to preserve mankind. So Locke would say that's objective. It can be known through reason. Now, Locke then is not a fool. He is well aware that most societies are not governed by reason. He's aware that most human beings themselves are also not governed by reason and that you will find in societies all sorts of practices that are deemed moral but that are in fact are not. I mean, I gave the example of sacrificing you know, virgins to the rain gods. I mean, Locke uh, was interested in, you know, this is the, the time in human history where we're starting to get accounts of how people in faraway lands live. And Locke seems to have read quite a lot. Um, he was interested in the primitive uh, peoples of the Americas. So he's aware that there were practices that you know, at the time they would deem barbaric and that the people who practiced them thought were perfectly normal. But for Locke, no, there is an objective natural standard of morality, namely this law of nature teaching that is binding upon, binding upon all men at all times. But it's, in a certain sense, rather rudimentary and therefore allows for a great diversity of, you know, customs and manners when it comes to a host of secondary uh, moral issues, like what's the right way to address your parents, uh, you know, uh, how should you structure uh, the relationship between a parent and a child. I mean, there's going to be room for a fair amount of diversity that way, but there are some underlying moral principles. Other questions? Let me follow up on that then just a little bit. I don't know if it's possible to resolve this question, but Going back to the whole marriage question and divorce, I mean, there's a lot, I mean, there's some things. This is a disputed question, but Locke would be aware of a religious tradition that would hold that marriage is indissoluble. Yeah. Christian tradition. He seems to think that that's going beyond the law of nature. Does he really think that's unreasonable? I mean, it'd be, that's a difficult thing for him to finesse because he might not say that openly. What do you think he thinks about things like that or religious obligations that go beyond the law of nature, maybe too demanding? Yeah, I mean... I mean, this raises the, the a very uh, disputed, I mean, it's kind of the central question among scholars is, was Locke a Christian? Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to weigh in on this one. I, I do think it is um, non-controversial to assert that even if he was, he was clearly not a small or orthodox one. That um, his Christianity broke decisively with many tenets of what Christians at the time would recognize as Christianity. He has a book called The Reasonableness of Christianity, um, which I think a more fitting title might be The Lockeanness of Christianity, in which he Lockeanizes Christianity, but while claiming to reveal its true nature. And lo and behold, it's completely compatible with the Lockean natural rights teaching. Uh, I think he saw a clear tension between uh, some teachings of the Bible and his project. Um, he clearly had a problem with the doctrine of original sin. Uh, he famously says, we never authorized Adam to contract on behalf of us. And so why should his sin <laughs> be transmittable to us? Uh, he clearly had a, a problem with the doctrine of providence because he thought that if you emphasize it too much, it makes men less likely to labor and acquire. And he wanted to excite human industry. Um, his state of nature teaching in chapter 5 of the Second Treaties is meant to displace the idea of a Garden of Eden. He says, in the beginning, all the world was America, by which he means poor and undeveloped, i.e. the America that uh, the Europeans found. And so he thinks that if you emphasize divine providence too much, people will say, well, I don't need to work that hard. God will take care of me. And Locke very much wants to emphasize the unprovidedness of man's natural condition uh, 
in order to stoke uh, their industry. Um, now, I, I think, you know, he, um, he, he would say that, going back to the point I made, it would be legitimate in a Catholic society to make marriage permanent. That, that would not be violating the liberty or the rights of uh, the people. Which, by the way, I'll mention in pa passing, you know, one unfair uh, slur against Locke is that he was anti-Catholic. Um, people th point to one of the restrictions he places in the letter concerning toleration, saying you're not allowed to tolerate a religion that teaches its adherents that they are subject to a foreign prince. And people say, aha, he means the Pope, and therefore we should not tolerate Catholicism. But if he wanted to say the Pope, he could have said the Pope. And the only references to Catholics in the letter concerning toleration are positive ones, that we ought to tolerate some Catholic doctrines like transubstantiation, because what's it to us whether you think this is the body of Christ or just a piece of host? Uh, so I, I, I think his teaching is we can't tolerate uh, an interpretation of Catholicism that would say that the Pope is a political ruler who has the right to overrule the, the government. But if you view the Pope as your spiritual leader, then that's perfectly legitimate. So I, I don't see, I, 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 don't, I, I don't think it's tenable based on the texts to argue that Locke would not tolerate Catholics. He wouldn't tolerate atheists, but he would tolerate Catholics. Very good. Other questions? If not, let me try one more. Sure. And then we'll see if there's another. And if not, then we can wrap it up. But I just want to follow up on something you said about, well, I, let me put it to you this way. Do the libertarians have a coherent account of punishment? You mentioned earlier that you think they can't give a coherent account of national defense. Just, you made me think about Locke uh, saying that if you initiate the state of war on somebody, it would be okay to kill you. And it'd be okay to not kill you, but enslave you. Um, so he's got some kind of thinking about how you deal with those who violate the law of nature. Libertarians are big about autonomy, but what do you do with people who violate the terms of autonomy, who do engage in aggression against each other? Well, you're allowed to retaliate. Um, the, 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 um, I, I have not um, read enough libertarian writings. I mean, life is too short and, and uh, there's only so much time. Um, the big split I see on them is, would it be legitimate for the government to retaliate? That, that, the, the, the big split is on, should you have a government do the retaliation, or do you do the retaliation yourself either privately or, say, through a voluntary police force that, say, all of us here live in a neighborhood and we all contribute each month to set up a police force so that if someone, you know, aggresses one of us, this, the, basically, this mercenary police force we hire does, defends us on our behalf. Uh, but no one, libertarians would not dispute the idea that if someone aggresses you, you're entitled to defend yourself. I, I don't know, however, if they have a theory of proportionality, uh, of if someone just push, I mean, how you can relate. That's where I said I haven't read enough. Um, and in all likelihood, I probably won't because I... <laughs> <laughs> more interesting questions I want to figure out. All right, do we have any final questions? Aha, very good. Let me bring you the mic. <clears throat> um, my question is more in regards to Locke's view on the family. Did Locke see an obligation to marriage in terms of like protecting the well-being of those children um, or just like marriage if it arose for the, like I don't know exactly. No, he, he, he did not think you were under, I mean, Locke was a bachelor. Um, most philosophers tend to not marry, or if they marry, say like Socrates, they're not very good husbands or, or fathers. So there is not in Locke a duty to get married. Uh, there isn't even, this is where Locke is amusing. Um, you know, you may know in the book of Genesis, the very first words that God speaks to man are, be fruitful and multiply. It's a commandment, an exhortation that we are under a duty, if we are believers, to have many children. When Locke interprets this passage, 
in the first treaties of government, it's section 33 if you're interested, he says, it contains within it to the encouragement of the improvements of the arts and sciences. So what he's more interested in is reading into that biblical verse uh, commerce and science. Saying, well, you know, if you want to be fruitful and multiply, you need prosperity and you need modern science. And that's what the Bible really wants. Yeah, you know, as if the Bible is Baconian or Lockean or has a, is glorifying free markets. But even in that verse, which imposes on all human beings a duty to have kids, his emphasis is not on the kids part, but on the Lockeanizing it, making it about commerce and acquisition, and then the sciences for the relief of man's estate. Uh, Locke on scripture is always very, I find, amusing because he's, uh, he, is, he is impious, uh, but not in the shocking way that other impious authors are, uh, more in the moderate Lockean way that Locke is. And then um, I guess my follow-up to that is sort of, you mentioned the obligation that children have that Locke described to like take care of their parents. Yeah. Were children, like when Locke describes that, are children supposed to move in a sort of like coalition to protect their parents or is that an individual right brought upon each child to like preserve the prosperity of their family? I mean, he, he frames it as an individual right. So I, I guess are you asking, you know, could we set up Social Security and Medicare because we don't want to care for our parents and we want to move on with our lives and we'd rather have someone else take care of it? Um, I think Locke might say yes, so long as it's voluntary. So I think Locke would say the problem with Social Security and Medicare is, well, one is it, it goes beyond insofar as it's compulsory, which it is, it goes beyond the mere preservation of life. I think Locke would say Social Security and Medicare could exist, but only for people who would die without it. Otherwise, we're not in the business to ensure a comfortable uh, and pain-free existence for you. We're in the business of keeping you alive, and uh, that's it. Now, in terms of uh, what about all of us deciding, to, to, this, uh, deciding part of me, to pay people to care, for, to care for our elderly parents, I think Locke would say, you know, if it's voluntary, so long as it's voluntary, that's fine. Now, you know, you could make an argument, but might this not be undermining the happiness of your parents if they feel that you don't really love them because you're off, you know, living your life wherever you are and they're parked in a retirement home and some, yeah, you're paying for it. Uh, you know, Locke obviously doesn't think about all these things, but. I think you could make a Lockean argument that this might undermine the happiness of your parents. Because he says, remember, you're, you're in the business of ensuring that you don't harm their happiness or their comfort. Um, so, you know, these are all things to, to think through. Locke obviously doesn't flesh them out. At the, he's not a public policy thinker, right? He, there's no, he didn't set up a think tank. He was a political philosopher. But it, it's, it's interesting to think through these principles, but you could clearly have some hired help to help you care for your parents. I think that would be uh, legitimate on Lockean grounds. What you couldn't do, though, I think, is force me to care for your parents, unless your parents were uh, in risk of life or death, and then you couldn't provide for their preservation, in which case the rest of the political community should kick in. All right, thank you. Let's thank our speaker. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.